Well, I'm going to be talking today about recovery issues from the standpoint of now that you have uh, taken what you've learned here in your research and uh, you have ministered to the person that has been, uh, had the misfortune of being recruited into a cult, well, they've said yes. They've said, I don't want to go back. But I have a lot of needs. And I've heard, what do I do now? Uh, that can be a kind of a scary thing. And uh, we get a lot of calls from people in this field who say, what do I do now? <laughs> Wellspring for 10 years has been uh, caring for people who are asking the same question. They said you have to, you know, you take could, and, we, could we shut the door? Or, sure. Do you to, uh, uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What we're going to be talking about is from a, a strictly uh, emotional standpoint using uh, uh, an illustration from the scriptures. What has happened to the person who has been in a high demand cultic uh, manipulative situation? What has happened to them that emotionally? Uh, it has to do with how cults pervert the golden rule. Anybody recall the golden rule? Mm -hmm. Give me an attempt to. Do you know what, 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 what uh, and would you specifically, the way that Jesus um, stated that with regard to which is the highest form of the law? What, what, what is the summation of the law? Neighbor as yourself. The, uh, uh, with regard to self and others, uh, because remember, we're we're uh, uh, many of us are deal with people who have been asking and seeking and knocking for God for a long time. That's probably why they got involved in the cult. We'll be talking tomorrow about a lot of times the people you're dealing with seem like non Christians, but they're uh, you may find very quickly that that may not be the case. But the, the idea is, is that these people have been asking and seeking. So they are, in a sense, in the best that they know, loving God with all their heart. The problem is, is that the way the cult has controlled them is by manipulating the last half of that statement. Loving your neighbor as yourself. Let me show you how it works. You've got love in the, uh, to, to put in modern English uh, a op sort of an operational definition of what the word agape or agape in, in the Koine Greek uh, would be a, a sort of an unconditional acceptance. And uh, it has, it, it's a reflection of the unconditional acceptance that God has of us because of what Christ is not a person of Well, there's a sense that that uh, what the call for us there is to be able to accept our our uh, and, and uh, our neighbor and our accept ourself. I'm going to put an M there for neighbor, and I'm going to put an S there for self. Now, this is the, if you will, it's kind of a model of of how the uh, the Christian lives his or her life with regard to, uh, to himself and, and to other people. It's an acceptance of self and acceptance of others. Now, uh, this is uh, kind of the orientation that what I call of the growing person, the person who's growing in Christ. You know, the growing Christian, you want to say. Now, the, uh, the problem, if I'm a cult leader, is people who accept people at face value or are willing to give people the benefit of the doubt or uh, 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 accept themselves as essentially worthwhile. These kinds of people are very difficult to, to push around. It's very difficult to manipulate them. Because if you try, then they'll say, well, that's not, you know, I can't, I can't accept myself and accept what you're telling me about myself. So I'm going to have to disregard what you're saying. So you end up getting into all those little knots. So if you, you, if, a per, if you find a person here, you've got to generate, come up with some kind of idea to change one of these or the other. And usually the first one that's attacked is right here. And it, 
And if, if it works like this, you've got loving neighbor, accepting neighbor, and self. And so the approach is to come up with some kind of, of teaching doctrine idea that calls into question whether I can accept myself as worthwhile as a human being. Now remember, uh, so, Self-acceptance uh, is, a, is a sense that we are we, we accept ourselves because of what God has done. There's not something we can do to add to that. What we're talking about here, though, is that is that a group has got to come up with something that says you aren't really worthy as a human being, worthwhile as a human being. And uh, usually, in a Bible-based situation, that comes up with some perversion of what it means to be a sinner. And that is that. that uh, uh, that sin is usually by taking, in my view, a lesser view of sin. The person wants to say that you are you are worth worth less as a human being because you're a sinner. Now, to me, that you know that uh, minimizes the effects of sin because the horror of sin is that is that we are not worth less as a human being. We still remain in the image of God. It's just that it's marred by something that's alien to the image of God, it's sin. So by taking this lighter view of sin and saying, oh, it's something about you as a person. Then, then pretty soon I, can't, I, I lose the ability to accept myself as I am. So I have to, then, then there is a, there, it allows the group to build a sense of dependence on the group so that I can feel acceptable as a human being. Now, this is the, the mindset of what I call the victim. The person who has been, and I mean this by the best of all senses, the person who has been, had the misfortune of being to be victimized by a totalist situation, by a, by a high demand situation. Now, the, uh, initially, as I say, the victim has lost the ability to accept self. But the ability to give other people the benefit of the doubt is left intact. So therefore, there is less of a tendency to criticize the leader. The person is able to you know, still accept and give the, give the leader the benefit of the doubt, even when sometimes their leader is inconsistent. Because there is the underlying sense that I'm not worthy anyway, so how can I possibly call into account anything that you would say? So I'll just have to wait until later, and then I'll know more because I, I'm worthless. Is this making sense? Anyone heard this before? Okay. Yeah. All right. Now the next stage. I mean, this is a stage. Of, this is the re- the recruitment, the, the 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 indoctrination process. The next stage. Once is the, in the first of the recruitment stage, the next stage seems to be what I call the shift from becoming a victim to where you become what I call a persecutor. The persecutor is the person who has made the shift. Uh, uh, I, I cannot feel worthy on my own, worthwhile as a person on my own. So I have to, have to take on the characteristics of the group that make me worthwhile. So suddenly, I come off feeling, yes, indeed, I am worthwhile. However, once I've done that, anyone who's not in our little corner of the world is not okay. They're not worthwhile. So I can't accept them. See, see how see, we're talking about how each one of these is a very subtle, each one of these stages is a subtle perversion of what Jesus refers to as the summation of the law of property. So there is a there is no longer a resist, resist the rejection of self because now that self has been subsumed into the belief, the, the belief system of the group. But now I reject my neighbors, those that are not in the group. As long as I identify with the group, I, I can accept myself, feel good about myself, no problem. See? Even if I've got faults. I apologize for being late. Mm-hmm. Is this a process you're describing where a person is broken down and then built back up? That's that's what happens between here. Within the framework raised up with them and their church in the framework of a movement. That's right. So they lose their one identity, but they get a new identity. Get a new identity. That's, that's, that's right. Now this person basically has the underlying statement that they say to themselves is if I'm hurting, I must deserve it in some way. Yeah. The progression from here is, you need what I've got. There's a, there's a, you know, there's a, once they have identified with the group, now it's you need what I've got. The, the focus is on. So you effectively strip someone of their of part of the character. Yeah. You, 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 you're, it, uh, there's a, the, what we're talking about. We started out with the the, uh, 
uh, the golden rule is loving your neighbor as yourself, loving, you know, loving God, loving your neighbor as yourself. And how the cults disturb, distort this very delicate balance in human relations and inner relations to, you know, to cause enormous psych, uh, psychological damage. And that's what we're, you know, why people are quite often very, very uh, sort of lost emotionally. They can't trust, they can't, you know, They don't trust themselves, they don't trust anyone else, it's part of their church, you know, because they've been a break on some very basic, I think, God given order in their life. Yeah. You also, just for clarification, did you also see that the baby itself is broke down prior to their entering into the cult or the group? Well, that's our possibility. It's, of course, it's a thing if you're already here from some other life circumstances. And then the love bombing effect or whatever they do. So much love effect. Oh, you know. Now, what we found is that uh, as far as uh, people who have chosen to leave groups, the research we've done on people who've left, at least we can't tell whether that's everybody in, but people who have chosen to leave, uh, in giving, we, we at the Wellspring, give a large battery of, science, of, 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 of psychological tests. And uh, we gave the same battery of tests to entering freshmen at our university. And if everyone has ever taken a psych 101 class, <laughs> if you took one at OU the last couple of years, you got one more yet. <laughs> Uh, but it's a standard psychological uh, family inventory. What went on, you know, what different you know, criteria, you know, factors that went in. What we found was there was no difference. You know, every scale, you could just plot them on the chart and they just followed with, them, with no statistical difference. So uh, now people from Ohio State would say, well, that's no surprise. And all those weird people don't think anymore. But, uh, in actual fact, what it does tell us is that, is that the, 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 uh, uh, the population of like groups, uh, as far as family background, they're identical to the general population. Some of them come from bad backgrounds, and some of them come from families like Ozzie and Harriet Nelson and the Cunninghams, and you know, you know Richie Cunningham. What are, what are some following in, in this type of breakdown uh, when they actually are seeking to, to get closer to God? You know, they're, they're seeking something that they get into a group that just well, I think as human beings, uh, they're, they're, you know, it fits us very well to love God with all our heart and soul and mind and love our neighbor with ourselves. I think that's that's kind of that's that's, our, that's how we're made. <clears throat> so I don't so that a person sometimes a person who's a seeker, I think uh, a lot of people get the impression that they have a need, that they have a there's something wrong with them, and so that they're a seeker. And um, um, you know, what we try to do is to recognize that sometimes I think seeking, being a seeker, is probably one of the uh, one of the better things about being a human being. It's probably probably part of the you know, part of the image of God in us that, that you know sort of that uh, because a person is a seeker, it doesn't mean that they are weak or or needy in some way. Maybe it could be that they're just more in touch with the fact of who of how they really are, and that you know, in need of, of of a steady relationship with God. The self and the but there's so many variables. It's impossible to say this is how it happened. Well, what we're doing is, is a general trend about as far as the distorting this the interpersonal relationships and how that you know and, and interpersonal and, and internal view of self and how that you know is affected by the culture. You have a room full of people and they could each be at a different stage. Well, they're either be here or here usually, and uh, uh, it, the. How, you know, there, there are people who go around basically with the idea that you need what I've got from, you know, uh, you know, and basically look like this, and we'll, we'll talk about one more. And then, but most of the time, people spend their time here in, in the initial phases of, of you know, called recruitment, with forays into these other, these other positions. Now, the, the, as the indoctrination process continues, most groups are not content that you are going along with the group and you're just agreeing with everything as long as you're all in the group together that you are you're okay, you're identifying with the group. They would rather you become what is known as a deployable agent. In other words, they want you to become like the cult leader. And so the next step in the indoctrination process is where uh, loss of love of neighbor, acceptance of neighbor is gone, but so is acceptance of self. 
there is a rejection of both self and neighbor. This person says, if I'm hurting, I must deserve it. And this person says, you need what I've got. This person says, if I'm not going to accept my neighbor, if I'm not going to accept myself, it doesn't matter what I do to you or what happens to me. This, then, is the doorway to believe a system that says the ends justify the means. Because it doesn't matter if I hurt somebody, if I crack a few eggs along the way. Because do I care about neighbors? Do I care about myself? Now, the scary, the really scary thing about people in this mode, and I call these people, it's going to be kind of weird, but I call these people rescue. 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 The really scary thing about these people is that you have to look real close to tell the difference between a rescuer and a growing person. Often. I mean, sometimes they're pretty obvious. Sometimes it's just real obvious. This is, you know, the rest of it. But a lot of the times, you have to look real close. These people often seem larger than life. They seem, uh, uh, some of them are very self-confident. They appear to, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, to be very self-assured, but at the same time can often be self-facing. And so they're very attractive people. So, but the, the way they really look is like this. There's a there's a, uh, uh, a sort of a central core that, as the indoctrination process proceeds, and in a minute we'll talk about what we're, how, how it works, it gets hardened and hardened and hardened, and so it's difficult for this person to have any, any sense of empathy or acceptance of anyone else. No real love that can get out anymore because of the shell that's been that developed. So what happens is that in order for the person to relate to the outside world, they have to create a mask. And that mask that mask gives gives us, you and I are out here on the outside and we're not we don't know that we're dealing with a culture. You know, we're gonna look at this and we're gonna say this person loves their neighbor and loves their son. And if they tell us that they love God or that they are God, you know. We're, how can we deny it? They sure seem like it. One thing about a rescuer, you got to love a rescuer. If you've ever met a real rescuer, they're just larger than life. They're just wonderful people. They're just people you just can't, a lot of them you just can't, uh, you know, uh, can't get away from. They're just something about them. You know, they're just very, very attractive. Well, that the... But the problem is, is that we're not dealing with a real person here. We're dealing with a projection, with, a, with, with, with what they want you to see, uh, what you want us to see of them. And a rescuer, remember, is incapable of actually having a relationship with another person. A rescuer can only relate to another person. Remember, a rescuer doesn't care about his neighbor and doesn't care about himself. So there's no real way of, of having a relationship. But what a rescuer does want is they want to feel uh, that they are significant in some way. And the way to do that is by controlling the lives of other people. You want to have people in the orbit. The rescuer has got to have people in the orbit around them. Okay. Now, how do they go about doing that? By creating a system where they find growing persons and turn them into victims them to become persecutors so that eventually they can become like me. Now, not like, not with a big mask, but once you've made the, there are two kinds of rescuers that I've been building up to here. One of them, of course, is the cult leader. Now, I call him a rescuer because usually you'll find a cult, a cult leader is always rescuing somebody. The rescuing the world from hell, the rescuing, uh, uh, you know, uh, mankind from the darkness of, of uh, uh, Unenlightenment or whatever. Um, the, you know, the, the chainsaw, the, the uh, uh, Brazilian rainforest from the chainsaw. It really doesn't matter. You know, there's always a cause uh, that they're they're rescuing. But the idea is, is that uh, what they usually set they set their sight on us, 
and they're going to rescue us. And a real rescuer, by golly, if you don't want to be rescued, you better get out of the way. Because a rescuer is going to fix your problem. And uh, the, the difference, one of the dead giveaways of a rescuer, just by the by, by, is that, uh, that a growing person, a growing Christian, is going to relate to another person who is in need, for instance, is going to extend care. But if the person says, no, thank you, the growing person is going to continue to pray for them and be concerned for them, but they're not going to make a nuisance of themselves. But that's not going to cut it for the, for the rescuer. Because the rescuer has a sense of, of loss if they can't seem to fix the world, make it the way they see you know, the, the image that they think that it should be. And so the rescuer has to, has to make you change. So they got to fix you. And so the rescuer will ask a question if you're, you know, if, any, if at any point you make the mistake of, of uh, being authentic with a rescuer and, and, you know, and you're in pain and you're tears or something like that, the rescuer's going to say, I just can't stand to see your hands. Yeah, that may sound like a caring statement. But what's the reference of that statement? That's right. It's what I can think. Remember, the rescuer does not care about you. They, they, they act as if they care about you. They sound like they're very self-assured. See? But both of them are, are, are not true. Okay. So, you and I are left here with, gee, this person is so nice to me, and they're doing, they're going all out of the way to do nice things for me. Okay. And uh, how can I, I mean, you know, turn away from them? I mean, they've been so good to me. Well, the, the, the eventual process is that you've got two, two kinds of rescuers. You've got the cult leader, obviously. The second kind is what I refer to as the true believer. The true believer is the person who has discovered what, what, what uh, ENMR and Washington Fellowship and all these other wonderful organizations have said about the cult leader. <coughs> and they realize, yeah, that's right. But... I am too emotionally invested in this thing working to back up now. And uh, a lot of times, if you're talking with a true believer, all the apologetics, are, you know, in the world won't get through. You know, it'll just all you're doing is basically planting the seed, and eventually, when they're in this mode, you know, which they will, they, people shift around. One day, when they're in this mode. Then all that wonderful research that you've done and that you told them will eventually take root and they'll leave. But while they're actually a true believer, they'll sit there and they'll smile at you and say, yes, well, there are problems. We recognize there are problems with that believer. And we have ways of fixing it. And, and, uh, you know, and yes, I know, you know, I know our, our leader has been accused of these sexual infidelities, but these are just discord I mean, I've heard a thousand excuses for it. Inconsistencies in the behavior of the you know, culture. Does this process sound familiar? Anyone know anyone who's been through this meal this here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, uh, uh, the answer is sometimes this begs the question well, if this is the case, couldn't we just you know, witness to them? Lead them to Christ, and then everything will be fine because then they would love God, and then they would love, automatically love the neighbor as themselves. Well, you know, uh, I'm not saying that the that the Holy Spirit can't do whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do, but I think that uh, as we'll be talking about more tomorrow, is that there is more more there are far seem to be far more resources available in the church than just making you Christian. And so we, and if you look at Jesus' ministry, he did a lot more things to help people than just build his movement. Of course, his focus was not on building a bigger movement. His focus was on caring for people, whether they followed him or not. You know, he still, you know, still ministered. So the, the, the thing that we have to ask ourselves is that, well, then, as a, you know, as a, as a, you know, as a church, uh, what do we do with these people? You know, are we going to, you know, I'll be, I'll be saying tomorrow, you know, we just lead them to Christ and let God fix them. <laughs> well, I think, I think, yeah, God will fix them, but you know who's going to use? Going to use you. And me. And 
取り直すんですよ。Yeah. So that means we have to learn a little something about what this person is facing, how this person is hurting, and how maybe we can make their life a little easier while they while they heal. Because they will heal. People will get better in spite of our <laughs> our mistakes. The question is, is that how can we make it easier for them to, to heal? How can we be, you know, the arms of Jesus that was that extended to this person, uh, even when this person doesn't want Jesus? Let's look a little more as to as, as to how how this has happened and what else has happened to the person. In a a a group that or a system that controls the way that a person thinks does it by controlling the way that they communicate. So that every time the the person behind the mask, let's start up here, the person behind the mask. Every time that, that uh, this is the, you know, this is this is you and me, they're going to chip away. Let's just draw a circle. You know, I'm going to draw two circles. So. A tripartite. I mean, what this, uh, what the person does is everything that they say is designed to chip away something in my sense of worth, you know, of worth of myself, or it's designed to get me to call into question. What the my my ability to accept others is on others I've got you know it's trying to get me to either reject myself or reject others. Every communication that the leader is going to get is going to eventually boil down to rejecting myself or rejecting other people. And uh, or mistrusting myself, mistrusting other people is another way of saying. Because as that begins to happen, then the chips begin to gradually start falling out of our, you know. Then we start beginning to say, well, who can I trust? Well, who's, who loves you? Who's been here for you? Who's, who's showing you all these wonderful new truths? Who's leading you along the path of the light? Man, I mess. Now, we don't know this mass. We just think they you know, they love it. Well, they're, they're chipping away, gradually chipping away pieces until by the time you get down to the victim stage, the person looks kind of like this. They're just sort of a you know, sort of a shriveled up little core of a person. Okay. The, all of the things that made them who they were has been kind of chipped away gradually by these, you know, statements. That's the love bomb. You know, the combination of love bombing and, you know, and criticism. One of, the, one of the favorite games of cults is you never know who's going to be hugged or slapped. You know, because usually the system gets so complicated in a cult, you never really know what to do because you can always either get in trouble or get a blessing. And a lot of cult leaders have just passed right through the the, uh, uh, the system of even having a co cosmology, and they have just become the kind of person that is that will reward someone who was either cruel or nice on a, on a erratic basis until everyone finally falls into line because they realize they can't predict what this leader is going to do. I mean, Gurdjieff is a wonderful example. Stalin. Stalin? Oh, yeah. Well, it is a, yeah. And... Uh, Many of these, many of these processes are gone right out of, of uh, uh, the uh, Stalinist, Stalinist you know, processes uh, that were based on things that are centuries old. Uh, a combination of cruelty, cruelty and kindness. You're rotten, worthless, worthy only of the dung heap, but we love you. Well, as the as the uh, process keeps on going, the uh, uh, the, the, the person is, as I say, is, is kind of a, there's a sense in which the person is restored gradually through this period is is stripped, but they can, they they can as they move to here can sort of feel. This is the this is the shrivel inner core, if you want to say. But here is the see the group has made up made up the difference, brought brought back to quote unquote wholeness in the image of the group. 
specific breaking down process and get building back up like you were talking about. It seems that most cults they like to attack Christianity, different forms of baptism, or find anything that a particular person like me have done in the past. Oh no, we don't do it that way, we do it this way. And that's right. That's right. It's anything that leads or that, that might call into question your worth as a, as a person. But they destroy their past and give them a new future. That's right. The key and, the, and the, the, the result of destroying the past is you lose a sense of acceptance of yourself. Can I offer an example? No, sir. Sure. Go ahead. A long time ago, I used to play around bands outside my home and many years ago. And uh, magnifying glass, gasoline down the hole. Anyway, when one colony of ants will attack and conquer another colony, the conquering colony will take captives, will turn into slaves. So if you look at an ant hill, you see different types of ants all moved in along. Those ants that were captured and turned into slaves were reprogrammed, and they act absolutely no differently than the ants who conquered them. So you can see black ants and red ants are different size ants. Conquered ants will be reprogrammed where they be exactly like those ants were conquered. Security. Well, the the uh, uh, ex-cultist is left again with uh, mistrust. There's a range as far as because every person is different. But as far as when you come down to, to, to rejection of neighbor, it comes from a sense of there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a mistrust to an out now enmity of others. Uh, just, a, just a fear of, inter of other people to where they're, just, they, you know, they're, they're uh, completely angry at anybody who names the name of Christ uh, because of the hurt that's, you know, that's come to them. But, you know, it can be anyone of a very wide range <coughs> as far as rejection of neighbor. Rejection of self can be occasional feelings of worthlessness, uh, all the way to uh, actively self-destructive. Uh, there's something about a totalist environment that does seem to trigger feelings of self-destruction. There's something about this process that that people somewhere in each stage of the process, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a the surveys we've done, it's amazing how frequently suicidal thoughts occur in this it has to do, I believe, with the destruction of the ability to accept oneself as being, as being worthy. Uh, the, uh, so the, what's left for us you know, is, is uh, what are we going to do with the person knowing that, that all, even though the person, that, remember, has left the group, a lot of times they're still struggling. Now, it's, it's kind of like uh, in the meeting this morning, the person was talking about how uh, after being convinced that uh, Joseph Smith was a false prophet, they were stripped away from everything they ever believed. Well, what was that? The core, a, 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 a shriveled core. And, um, you know, we, we need to be able to, 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 to know what to expect next. We need to know what's under there. In other words, they're not going to get instantly better, even if they do feel a little relief. Sometimes people, when they find out that an oppressive ruler, oppressive leader was, you know, was really a fraud, they do have some temporary relief. But quite often there is a very damaged core in there that uh, uh, you know, is not going to get better on its own. It's going to need our care and support, even though they're not going back to the group. You know, we may not even talk about the group much. Or if we do talk about the group, it's just that how current events in their life remind them of what Reverend so and so used to say, or, or Guru Omakash oh Kaji used to say. I think the biggest thing that a lot of tonight too, or people who come out of this, is we immediately expect them that they join the Christian church. You're all better. You're all better. That's right. You know, you're better. It's all done with. Very frustrating for a uh, for an ex member, and because uh, a lot of times family members, it's something that if you're dealing with a family, you know, with with, with ex cultists, there's family, the one you, the one you know, you know. Get it across. They're not going to be all better just because they've left. A friend of mine that's in a sensual class been out of one for 12 years. And uh, just recently I started doing research for my brother-in-law uh, because his involvement is really bad church, um, especially at this point. And I started handing some information at the park. 
she started reading, and then she started, you know, getting all this other information, mm -hmm. and realized she could not be on one. She thought for a long time she was going crazy. That's right. You know, something would have to be wrong with her because everybody else was normal. That's right. If a person who has been, or is a person in the music group that does not get adequate care, remains in this situation, but feels like uh, they're wearing a clown suit in a black and white movie. They, they feel like they stand out. When they go to church, they feel like, you know, I must be weird here. Everyone else seems to be, know what to do, feel comfortable, and I can't even decide, I can't figure out what's next. You know. uh, it's a, so it, it's a very difficult time for the, you know, uh, for the extremer. And uh, quite often, um, the, uh, uh, some of the wisest counsel that I've heard is that I've heard some people actually even go to their deeply evangelical or their, <laughs> Uh, when a witness to the last trump, you know, are going to say, well, look, if you're triggered by going to church, don't go. We'll just get together and talk. You know, uh, it's because it, what's because the problem is is that a lot of times going to a conventional church, if they were abused in the church, and it sounds like heresy, but you know, but we're not talking about saying, oh, church is bad, or don't go to church, or forsake the assembly of yourself together. You know, we're just going to have to create an assembly that this person can feel safe. It doesn't, you know, church is not limited, as we all know, to the building. It can be given a lot of different forms. They, they do need church, but they don't necessarily need, you know, the person at this church with no problem. They need their hand held for a while. They need their hand held. They need their hand held, but they need their hand held by somebody who understands what they've been through and, and is, is able to say to them, you know, most people who went through what you've been through would feel the same way. Because every time something like this happens, you know, they feel like they're the only one. They feel like they're weird. You know, they feel like that. You know, that uh, well, what they feel like is that I'm a wor worthless, rotten person, and I can't trust anyone else because I've been so hurt. And it's our job as we begin to give, as we begin to give encouragement. And again, usually the first place to start is here because we really can't do much about their perception of us. All we can do is to reflect as best we can the love of God for them and let God work on this part of it. But if we, if we work here, if we focus on encouragement, acceptance, even if, I mean, a lot of people are very shocked when they come to Wells Street. They know that we're Christian, but they tell, they say, look, I was in a group for seven years where the guru said he was God and he did, he did magic tricks and miracles to convince us that he was. Don't tell me anything about God. What do you do when you're a Christian? <clears throat> you serve God. He's, you know, he's in heaven, but what are you going to tell him? You've got to be very careful. You better not have an agenda. Because they'll pick it up in a minute. Well, how are you going to how are you going to reflect Christ to this person? It's going to involve encouragement, acceptance, even acceptance of the fact that they're not going to be able to trust God. Uh, the reason I talk about acceptance is that usually the ex-member is already guilty enough. They already feel really dumb for believing that a 13-year-old boy from India was got in you know, or whatever, you know, whatever the person is done. Uh, it's, they, they already feel dumb, stupid, worthless, uh, and, uh, and, and, and guilty, they may have engaged in immoral activity that before they got in the group they would never have done. So they're already, you know, and they, they've rationalized it when they're in the group. They've already usually had a, a, a plenty of guilt. So that's why acceptance from us usually comes as, a, as quite a relief for them. Because they're expecting a, a religious community to do the same that their last religious community did. And that's reject them because they were with, you know, they were with could measure up. Well, we don't reject or accept people because they measure the standard. Because we don't have to make this. Jesus has already paid the price. He's already met the standard for us. So we don't have to accept other people. As if that's why we can be commanded to love our neighbors as ourselves. Uh, as we begin to do that, then the wonderful thing that happens is that 
uh, is that we become usually the first person to really do the trust. And so just by working on this, it starts and, and, and it starts to fall this. Now, as that happens, lo and behold, guess what happens? The person becomes a persecutor, often becomes a persecutor. And they want to tear up their call. They want to go, they want to go, I don't want to expose these people. I can't believe you know. And then after a while, they go back to, oh, I'm so stupid, I can't believe my father. They're going back to the process. But they're healing. You know, if we can, at Wellspring, quite often, if a person is very numb, and most people are, when they come to Wellspring, if in two weeks we can get them to the point where they're really, really angry at their culture, then we have, we've undone, we've un- un- they've started on the, on the road to recovery. You think, well, gee, you know, they weren't, they were nice and calm when they came, and now they're, they're they yell, you know, these nice Christian people cuss, <laughs> you know, they say words they didn't, they would never say the words. You know what we say? They're getting in touch with something. And eventually, they'll be here. That's right. Are we about out of time? Mm-hmm. A few more minutes, I guess. Any questions? You described pretty well what takes place in the local church. They're broken down, they're built back up, they become part of the fight. Mm-hmm. They all get exactly the same. They can't step out of line, otherwise they get shot. Mm-hmm. Once you're in, you're in. It's yeah. very hard to get those people out. But, uh, Sometimes we say though, but ex-members, they're very upset of what of being deceived and misled. Many of them will not go back to church for quite a while because they were burned once, so they don't experience. But they don't even, they cannot trust the pastor. They cannot trust the one who stands behind a pulpit. They don't like the church buildings with pews out. They don't like any of the traditional hymns or some traditional hymns and unless of course you're in a charismatic group and then you then you can't can't handle the worship courses and walk through some kids. Because you were stripped of it. <laughs> That's right. You're given an environment, and it's hard to go back to either environment after that. And sometimes you get a handheld and you walk back into the environment and you go. Do you recommend a book or several books that were covered as material? Uh, these are uh, uh, adaptations of, of several uh, uh, basic uh, counseling concepts. And uh, probably um, the the for 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 a very technical book, we have a, uh, it's a book called Trauma and Recovery. Uh, a number of interesting books that are from the field of, of recovery from childhood sexual abuse are very good in understanding how um, uh, people recover from you know from cults. And people would think, well, why would that be the case? Well. Oddly enough, it's the, the core, the damage to the core that occurs in abusive childhood or abusive, or, or abusive relationship is, is almost identical. In fact, we don't have a different treatment plan for people who are abused in marriage or abused in cult. It's the same treatment plan. It's the same thing. Uh, you know, it's, it's, we, we find the same kinds of, kinds of approaches. Whenever a person is in a situation where they were abused and felt powerless to do anything about it, the, the, the kind of damage to self and ability to trust is, is the same. So there, there are a lot of excellent books. I, I suggest the uh, the uh, uh, self-help book of the, the section of Christian bookstore probably will have some, you know, some good uh, books on childhood sexual abuse recovery. Be careful of those that say, "Well, I just prayed and God made it all better." You know, there's a lot of them out there, you know, and uh, uh, and there are a few of them out there that said. That Ten years ago, they wrote a book that said, "I just prayed and God made it all better." And now they wrote a book that says, "Guess what? It wasn't all better. I just, I just thought it was." <laughs> but uh, the uh, uh, trauma and recovery, Judith Herman. That's uh, one book that I can, I can recommend. It is quite technical. It's, it's uh, Judith Herman. It seems that if we're not familiar with what you've gone through here, it causes harm to us. Right. Get them out of a cult or tell them how bad a cult is, you can do harm to them and put up Well, you can see that what causes harm is not a, a, a Christian doing what we're called to do loving God with all our heart, 
loving our neighbor as ourselves, we're not going to harm somebody. The problem is, is that quite often, uh, when we have, have made our entire focus on un untangling the cult or exposing the cult, we come off to the person like, like a persecutor. We come off to the person that you need what I got. Say, I've got it together and you don't. I'm right and you're not. You know, and even if we try to be nice about it, there's still the same, that, you know, we still can quite often come to the ex-cultist as if we're the expert, you know, we know what we're doing and we don't. You know, it's, going to, it's very important that we have to realize is that it doesn't matter that we're right. What matters is their health. Okay. I would rather be wrong. <laughs> you know, no, that, I'm, and again, because I, they're not there, occasionally I find myself right wrong. Actually, was, I thought I was wrong, but I was really right. <laughs> that counts, they say. I guess I got it. <laughs> uh, but Christians who are here and regard other people as, worth, as worthwhile, even when they can't regard themselves as worthwhile, are not going to do harm. But the problem is, is, that, is that if we have been focusing so long on pulling down a cult, and then we deal with the next member who's already left as, you know, as, as uh, gee, isn't it great now that you're out of that terrible cult, you don't believe that stuff about, you know, uh, all of us becoming gods or the tripart nature of man, and just wonderful, and we keep talking about doctrine all the time, you know, uh, you know, yeah, we, we can do it. We can get in the way, I guess it would be another better thing, get in the way of their, you know, their, their recovery process. And I can just, I, I, I believe that wrong. I believe I actually spent the years after I made the picture of it and realized that I had done it at the time, uh, my brother in law is in Spindale, where it's at, and it's really bad. Um, uh, he's been in it for over 10 years, and his father passed away, April, and, and um, he, this group is a discipling group. They go nowhere alone. They're not allowed, uh, he has no contact with the outside whatsoever. He, Oh. Occasionally had some with the family up until his father passed away. And then we had made a um, uh, suggestion that he not bring all of his church with him because they overtook his mother's funeral a uh, year and a half before. And upon doing this, he got very irate. And of course, I was the one that had made the request on behalf of the family. And um, so he promised us he won't bring the kids. You know, we're being blessed uh, So the night before the actual memorial service, they come in from Danlars. There's like 50 mm -hmm. of these people that show up. And this very small church, the room is much larger than this. And there were like 50 of these people that showed up. And they all made, oh, the, the head person makes a beeline straight to me. Introduces, is introduced, and then I just thank her for coming and just kind of hope she looked. But, uh, I'm not saying too much more than that. I made him aware that I knew what he was involved in. Mm -hmm. And he didn't like the idea. Right now, I'm not right with God. He will not speak to me. He will not, you know, he has disassociated himself with me, with the family members that I am in contact with. Mm -hmm. And he is now completely secluded to this church. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I made a bad mistake, but I think that part of it is God. And, um, and I can tell you pray for him because I know he will come out. I mean, in my heart I know he will come out. But from people that I have seen and spoken with, they say he's leadership material, which is frightening because I know that in the process of learning, I know there's, there has to be things that just stick out in his front lines that are wrong. Um, but in the process of learning this, I know that there's others that he's leaving down the wrong mm -hmm. path. And it's also very better. difficult for the ex member who has been a leader uh, to, it's very difficult to, uh, or, or recruit, especially recruit people. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they're very high on those groups. How come people on the brink of suicide, the guilt for taking so many people into the local church, mm -hmm. or Mormonism, or JWs, mm -hmm. others are so hurt? Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important to understand that they were part of the process that they had no clue. No. They thought that they were, that they really, you know, there, there's a sense of what you, you have to realize is that, is that not even God uh, it, it deals with absolute responsibility. If you look, you can see plenty of places in Scripture where there's obviously 
mitigate the circumstances. And what we need to get across to the you know to people in a situation like that is that is that hey, you know, you thought you were making, you know, uh, you were choosing making decisions based on what you thought was right, you know, if you thought that you were doing the best for them and so on. But the fact is you were part of a process that you didn't have a clue. It was well orchestrated and that's why it worked. And uh, so it's, it's getting across to the person that, they, again, they aren't alone. You know, because they did this, um, you know, it was, was not necessarily a fault of them, it's a fault of the process that they got into. And once you can get the, you know, the, the focus off the fact of, oh my God, what have, what have I done, onto the idea, which is not an unhealthy thing, but, they can't, but it can't stay there. Okay? And then you get it onto the fact that I was in a process that made me do something I would never do to them. And then you start you start healing, and you're getting them to the point where they can even take you know correct, more sensible action, you know, to uh, uh, to deal with advocacy against the you know against the group. A good example is the Apostle Paul. He perceived the Christians believing he was doing God's will, and later on he said that he was the chief of the sinners. I suspect right. that he carried a great deal of guilt on him. That's the fact. Well, I think it's I think it's very fitting that there were 14 years between the time of his conversion and before he administered it. And about right. I think so. The, the, the issue there with Paul, though, I think, is he, he felt the burden toward owing it to God out of service, not necessarily the you know, guilt he felt to give him what he did. Well, I think it's the mask is something I wanted to ask you about. Could you, uh, the mask could be a social construct of the group, in a sense. In other words, but it could also be a spiritual thing that the person takes on. Well, it's probably, I, I would refer to it probably as a psychological entity. Uh, I get a little nervous about. Um, uh, well, unless you've been in one, I've been in one, and it could be a, it could be another entity. Yeah, it's, there's a, there's certainly it's certainly a psychological entity. It's, it's certainly well, like a social construct in a sense that you know the group is actually constructing what type of person you should be. Oh yes. Oh yes. Yeah. Absolutely. But it's sometimes also the group, sometimes the group constructs what the leader should right. be, and the leader just sort of steps into the role. But it also can be, in my experience, it could be actually some sort of spiritual entity that actually gets back to one of this person. Mm-hmm. You know, that's just, yeah, and mm-hmm. like, I just wanted to accept that and what you thought about that. Well, is it the, the, the uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure what I would do about it if it was, if I, if I use the term spiritual. Well, if, 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 it, if it's gone, it's gone. Well, the, uh, the thing is, is that, is that when a person, though, has been in a group, a lot of times as a true believer, you want to wear a mask. Okay? And you leave the group, you still got your mask. It's just that, you know, you don't have more context for it. And so there's there's this thinking that everything should work the way, you know, we have to leave the group, and it just doesn't work. And, and uh, uh, again, when you, when, when you can begin to expose the mask as a construct that the group induced them to believe was there, but it really wasn't. Then you know, then you can begin to say, "Oh, okay, I'm really me under here." Now the key is to get them to realize, "I'm really me under here, and that's okay." okay? I can, you know, because God's commanded me to love myself. Why does He command me to love myself? Because He doesn't want to, He doesn't want us to disagree with Him, and He loves us. <laughs> but we don't want to be in a situation where He loves us and we don't. <laughs> that, that that way, we're disagreeing with Him. Thank you for for coming. Can you come to me through Wellspring and you can take it back? Best place to do Wellspring.